Okay, our darling daughter is now three years old. This is her first birthday party. Can't you just hear me say, telling her to smile and look at the camera, Karen? That also means looking into the floodlights, but Karen did her best to comply with my request. This is the first time she had seen candles that relight. Watch, and soon you will see a bit of consternation on her face. I just blew it out. Notice that you're even using sterling silver. Stephen at two, who will be on in just a moment, is eating with a fork rather than his fingers. You probably all got some instruction on eating smaller bites somewhere along in your childhood. I'm impressed with how much more formally we dressed. Can you imagine a three-year-old birthday party today with the boys in wool pants, a tablecloth on the table, sterling silver, all the little girls with their hair curled? The children were cuter then, too. Just to prove how cute the children are, see them walking on the lawn in the housing. I had just finished making these clothes and took you outside to show off my handiwork. I adore these little unrehearsed action as Stephen falls down and both he and Eric brush the dirt from Stephen's knees. If navy blue, blue wool strikes you as impractical for two and a half year old and a five year old boy, just look at this next sequence. Even though we had moved to Sutherland, our friends in Eugene remained our true friends. One Sunday, we drove to Eugene to attend church with the balls and then go on a picnic to Armitage Park. You're still in your new clothes as you go wading in a shallow portion of the Willamette River. Eric did take his pants off, and Karen did her best to keep her dress dry. That's Karen Ball helping her. Karen was never certain about the safety of water of water here or at the ocean. The year's 1951, and finally it looks like the store might be a success. Almost most of the bills were paid by now. So what would be better than have your own candy store? I thought it'd be nice to take the children down to the store, just give them free run of the candy and the peanuts and the toys, and let them pack them outside and see how they would react. Well, the boys were willing to go along with that, but Karen felt that things should be kept orderly, and that they shouldn't be kept there. After all, Dad wasn't making a lot of money, and we needed those things to sell. As fast as the brothers would take stuff off, why Karen would put it back on the shelf. Oh boy, what a fun day down at the seashore with the nice warm sand and the cool water. But Karen, like again, she had her fancy new dress on and she didn't want to get it wet. Uh, one of the outstanding and the most joyful times of our visits from people was when John and Marty Russell and their children would come over from Wyoming and spend a few days with us. And of course, we always had to go to the beach if it was in the summertime, because that was rather unique for them being out there in eastern Wyoming. We just saw Jack Russell in the previous one, the first young fellow. He hit for the beach right away. 
Jack was always a delightful, kind, wonderful boy. Now, Eric with his Hoot Gibson cowboy outfit that he wouldn't part with, beach or no beach, he had to go out in his count there. Now, again, that same summer, we had the pleasure of having my Uncle Jim and my Aunt Mabel, who raised me, and Aunt Agnes from from San Francisco. Jim and Mabel were from Nevada, and Aunt Agnes was from San Francisco. Jim was like a dad to me, and I always referred to him as dad, and Aunt Mabel was like a mother, and she always referred to her as mom. Now here's Mabel and Agnes trying out the beach, but a little bit camera shy. Growing up in Oregon means growing up with water, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, the ocean. Here the children have their first recorded boat ride on the Umpqua River. As I watched this section, I thought of other times we'd had fun with water. Twice, Marilyn and Leanne came to spend the summer with us while Beulah went to summer school. We all swam in a pool in the Kalapuya Creek, west of Sutherland. The water was over Marilyn's head, but she dog paddled across the creek, spitting and sputtering, while I held my breath. I couldn't swim at that time. Do you remember once or twice we took lanterns and went swimming in the dark? Leanne often writes about that summer when she sends Christmas cards. We remember her poison oak. She writes of Kalapuya Kickapoo. You children all seem a little apprehensive on this your first boat ride. We're all dressed in warm clothes, so maybe you were all so cold. I get little shivers of cold when I remember that Fred was the only one who knew how to swim, and there is no life jacket in sight. When we first moved to Roseburg, I had my first experience in a large river. I had never learned to swim in dry rural Idaho, and I was enchanted with the wide sandbar and the slow-moving river and the scenery. <clears throat> Huge trees coming down to the river bank on the opposite side. I hope you remember some of those swims we had when, you were, when we were living in Roseburg. We have some slides, but no movies of a time when Susan and Luann Hansen visited us. Bruce and Kevin Jones, older men of 18 or 19 at that time, entertained Susan and Luann as they left to fly home to Utah, Susan said. We swam in the Pacific Ocean, Fall Creek Reservoir, Waldo Lake, and Willamette River. <clears throat> Here, Eric is steering the boat, round and round and round. Perhaps Matt and Kenneth, Mark and Kara, remember steering Grandpa Wah's boat in the same way. I remember it, I wonder if Matt and Kara remember the times the motor on the boat stopped and Grandpa Wah had to swim in the lake to push us to shore. If we had been in the river, you might even have ended up in the ocean or at Japan. At this time in your lives, you're all a little more comfortable on dry land. Can't see too many smiles right there. Eric at five was devoted to his cowboy boots. <clears throat> no other shoes would do even when he outgrew the pair he was wearing. So here he takes them off to get the sand out. <clears throat> Some things don't change. Steve has liked to tease since the day he was born. You saw him at Christmas when he was only a year and a half, put a plastic box over his head and strut around in front of the camera. Here he throws sand in the camera. Just look at that grin. Ruth and I, being from Nevada and Idaho, there is no beaches and no ocean. I always love the Pacific Ocean. This is taken from West Highway 99 as you travel down around the Reedsport area. We're standing, taking a picture from the highway down to the beach. This time we had 
This is that same beach down below Winchester. Lucille chased us with us this day. We went to the beach. It was a little bit cool and a little bit windy. And there's a little fella under roost jacket making his presence known as it's about time for him to come into the world. Here's some scenes along the beach that we took there in this picnic. Some of the folks are even more courageous. They would drive their cars along and occasionally we'd see one stuck deeply in the sand. We've always enjoyed these beach parties and the children have always enjoyed them. It was one of our favorite activities and one of the reasons we came to Oregon. And of course the sand, that is, that's what the children love. On a little hillside, the sun is shining, the sand is warm to the feet and soft, and a great time is had by all. Now getting into the water, that's another proposition. The Pacific Ocean is cold, and all the enticement of Dad, I couldn't make his sails pitch to Karen, no way, she'd rather swim in the sand. But there's one way to having the big, handle the big girls, and that just push them into the water. So I took Lucille and forced her into the water, and she was a good sport about it. Then next came someone else's turn. But he too wasn't very enthusiastic. So I put them both on my back and thought, well, I'll just back in. But Karen saw what I was doing, and she hopped off and ran for the warm sand again. And Eric, who's always been a little more adventuresome than the rest of the children, and liked things that were different and challenging. He hung on, and I thought if I backed up into the water, he wouldn't be quite so frightened. But now on the sand, I'm going to get to play horsey to all three of them at one time or another. There we go. Here, Bruce is a two-week-old baby suffering the fate of most two-week-olds, not sure he's going to keep his food down. Bruce was the biggest of the children at birth, eight pounds, six ounces. He was three weeks late. No one should ever criticize Bruce for being late again. Obviously, being a little tardy is genetic with him. His parents did it to him. Karen and Steve each weighed in at six and a half pounds, and Eric was a four and a half pound preemie. That means he got here six weeks early. Oops, there it comes. <clears throat> By this time, I'm pretty casual about a little throw-up, and Bruce settles down, closes his eyes, and continues to eat. Mm -hmm. Story of your children. And so I had to show off before the new camera and give him a haircut. Now, he's lucky if I had both ears on after I got through, and I'm sure that Ruthie was wondering if she'd escape with either ear. Christmas gifts were plentiful because we had presents from Mabel and Jim and Grandma and Grandpa Peterson. And Agnes always was most generous with us and with the children. Since the trauma of the Great De Depression affected this generation the most, they often sent sweaters, pajamas, or other clothing, all very welcome to a young family. When you look at this toaster, Bruce, do you remember Mrs. Carson, who taught you to make cinnamon toast in this very toaster, and who was kind to you during your preschool years? We also got presents from Pop and Lenore, Fred's father and the second wife. They often sent toys, and we always got gifts from Beulah and Art and Mary. Other family members sent family good gifts of food or games for the family to play together. That shirt that's the Eric's beginning to open was made from cotton flannel from a quilt. The flannel was left over from a quilt that mother made. The quilt was still in their home when they died. 
Perhaps you remember sleeping under it. In those more formal days, Karen and I both have our hair curled and my makeup is on. We're a little like our Nancy is now. She always looks beautiful before she comes out of the bathroom. We were the only family that had children in the mine, and so we had a lot of single miners and friends of mom and pops would come Christmas time and give us gifts. I recall I re at one time I had three drum sets. The necklace is Mexican rhinestone. I still have it. If you want to borrow it, just let me know. Here's Karen looking at some nice warm flannel pajamas. You'll also see me getting a nighty and some flannel pajamas. This is an apron that my mother made for me. She always kept me in aprons all my life. When she died, I still had kitchen aprons that she'd made for me. In this place that we lived, we'd, we, just, we didn't have any heat, only a wood stove that we used for heating water and space heating. So you can see why we all had w warm pajamas on or why we all got flannel pajamas. One magic Christmas of my childhood happened during the Great Depression. My parents couldn't even pay the payments on the farm. Because they had always had a great credit rating, they were able to arrange with the bank to pay just the interest. Naturally, Beulah and I expected to find some clothing Mother had made while we were asleep at night under the Christmas tree. I still remember the excitement, the disbelief, when we found large dolls sitting in wooden rocking chairs. My parents had sold something, eggs or cream perhaps, or even a pig, and had bought the chairs and dolls. The chairs lasted all through my childhood and through yours. You each spent some time in the chairs tied in against a pillow, when you were less than a year old even, with a dish towel before you were too little to sit up securely for any length of time. I could work and give you a little rock now and then and talk with you, and you were content as I cooked. I know you don't remember being tied in the chair, but the chairs went to Stephen's children and Karen's as a third generation heirloom. Fred did some uh, minor repair on the chairs just before we gave them to our grandchildren. Here I am opening tablecloths and napkins. Tablecloths, I use tablecloths and cloth napkins all the time. It was just the way you did things, or at least I did things in those days. And I thought I was lucky because the generation before, the women had scrubbed their clothes on a board and boiled them in a copper boiler to get them white. Here's another shot of Bruce as a two-week-old baby. That isn't a very good way to hold the baby, but we did want to have him in the picture, just to prove that he was here. I think this is a wonderful picture of the other children. They're all so beautiful, Stephen and Karen and Eric. You're not beautiful yet, Bruce, but most two-week-old babies aren't too beautiful. So you just hang around about 15 more minutes into this tape and you'll be a handsome young child too. So one of the things in those days a man always received was ties. Ties was a, a nice gift to give someone when not knowing what they might need and what they might not need. Even today I think it's a nice gift for someone. Even though the ties used to be about five dollars, now they're 25. Anyway, little Bruce is sitting in my hand and in my arms, and the other children are gathering around, seeing the ties, and they love the color of the ties. At this point, I was trying to get them to sing and join in a song, but my got very little cooperation. Their mind was on toys and boxes full of goodies and 
the mysteries of Christmas. They were delightful. They were probably so startled to hear Dad try to sing that they lost track of the fact that they were supposed to be part of the singing. Karen got a doll whose hair could be combed, and apparently this doll also would drink milk. You notice Karen taking a little drink out of the doll's milk back there a few scenes before. And Stephen looks like he's had about all the Christmas excitement he'd like. He'd sort of prefer a nap right now. It's the summer of 1951 in Idaho. Eric is six, Karen four, and Stephen three. Grandma and Grandpa Peterson always made a lot of preparation for our visits. In the summer of 1951, long after he'd sold all the horses on his own farm, he rented a horse so you could ride. Eric doted on every cowboy symbol or artifact. When he was three years old, he, we struggled every night to get his cowboy boots off. He wanted to sleep in them. He would have worn his first pair of jeans until they were worn out without ever washing them. Once he found them in the dirty clothes basket and brought them out indignantly. These work in clothes, not dirty. Grandpa's trying to get you each a little bit familiar with the horse before you actually ride on it here. And I noticed that all the cowboy, ha all of you have cowboy hats, so you, Eric must have persuaded each of you uh, to uh, the joy of being of cowboys. Here Grandpa helps Karen to get somewhat accustomed to the horse and gives her a little ride. This horse is no fiery steed. Father was the only one who could make it go. We generally had to lead it. That was probably just as well, for at three, four, and six years old, you are wisely cautious. Stephen didn't get comfortable until he had his big brother Eric holding him on. I rode two miles to school on a horse when I was six. I sat on the back of the saddle and hung on to my big brother Gene. Eric maintains his adventuresome spirit at six. He's obviously enjoying the new experience. He never liked to turn into the driveway when we returned home from even a short trip. Stephen, on the other hand, frequently said, home again, with complete satisfaction. Once you are both accustomed to this huge beast and Stephen is holding on to the horn of the saddle with his big brother Eric holding on to him, you decide that this novel adventure is fun after all. In fact, Eric argued to get to ride longer, but Grandpa Peterson was there to help me teach you to take turns. Oh, it'll be. I like this section with Karen. My favorite, in my youth, our family went to a lot of rodeos. My favorite act was the trick riders pretty girls in spangled costumes whose horses wore glittering decorations, rode around the arena in daredevil positions. Sometimes the girls even sat, stood on the shoulders of the male companion. Here Grandpa lets Karen be a trick rider. We move now to the scene on the front lawn at the Petersons. It's still the same summer. The family gathered to celebrate Grandpa Peterson's 64th birthday. Here Jean and Wilda try to assemble a chaise lounge we bought together. Bill and Perry, Marie and me. We all thought 64 or 65 signaled an era when people began to rest covered with a nice blanket. Grandpa continued to run the tractor and manage the farm until he was 87. When he died at 95, the chaise lounge was like new. The children, meanwhile, had the croquet set out. Karen is putting the pieces back, just as she put the toys and candy back in the shelf in the scenario, scenario at the drugstore. No, no one has shown you what to do with a croquet set yet, although Stephen obviously knows what to do with a ball.
And Eric remembers that when the movie camera is working, cooperative children run or dance or make faces. As in any family, everyone thinks he or she has a solution to the problem, and that's just what the group needs. Here, everyone screws a section or offers advice. Bill hadn't had much experience with cro any more experience with croquet than Eric, Karen, or Stephen. Finally, in spite of all the willing helpers, the chaise lounge is completed. Grandpa dutifully takes his place and reads the birthday card and poses with the grandchildren for the birthday photo. You see Leanne and Marilyn and Karen, Eric and Steve. This is another continuation of this same summer. Grandpa Peterson gives the three oldest children a real buckaroo ride. What can be more insistent than three youngsters? especially when their mother is recording these antics for posterity. Did you see Grandpa get that kick in the eye? <laughs> Almost get a bruise in my own ribs as I watch this. <laughs> Grandpa looks up. Hoping for a reprieve. You can see his suspenders pulled off. But he's a good sport. Stephen loses out to his more aggressive siblings. The children are persistent and dear old grandpa gives them one more effort. Watch Grandpa's lips and you can hear him say, that's enough. But the children continue. <laughs> and Grandpa is a good sport and goes on with it. <sighs> Makes me tired to look at it myself. Stephen discovers that he can play his teasing game. Run up, hit Grandpa's head while he's occupied with 70 pounds of clutching riders. Look at Stephen's grin. It's now the Christmas of 1951. There's a children's table and an adult table. We're in Idaho for this Christmas again. Jean and Wilda, Marie and Jim, who is now my parents' third son-in-law, Buell and Perry, me, and Grandma and Grandpa Peterson. They remodeled the living room and dining room shortly after these pictures were taken. Our family has grown till we need an adult table and a children's table to accommodate us all. I just left to go into the kitchen to look after the children. Marilyn wrote a nice letter to my parents telling them how much she enjoyed going to their place for Thanksgiving and Christmas all of her life and how delighted she was when she grew up enough to sit at the grown-up table. Here, Marilyn and Karen. And Leanne, sitting on books, obviously. Stephen, <laughs> very cute. And Bill, look barely big enough to sit at the little table. Bruce and Anne, at one year old, doing that tottering walk, so charming in, ta in children. If there's snow, you build a snowman. We were still doing that in those wonderful ski parties at Black Butte and Sun River when Steve and Nance, Bruce and Chris were in their 40s. This lady is quite a masterpiece, you must admit. And doesn't Fred look handsome? Although now he would be wearing a ski cap instead of his hat. It's 
that's the back of Eric watching his father trowel on some additional snow and Karen in a little hooded coat fun with families is timeless Even tiny children feel it. Children aren't the only ones who get to celebrate birthday parties. I have warm memories of this Christmas of 1952 Grandma and Grandpa Peterson rode the sleeper on the train from Bancroft to Portland. We picked them up at that elegant old train station and brought them to Sutherland. They stayed to celebrate Mother's 59th birthday on January 12th. Since they lived in the snow country and buried their own roses under a foot of mulch to keep them from dying in the winter, they were enchanted with fresh roses from our garden on the table. Mother was always reluctant to have her picture taken, and I think she looks relaxed and happy here. There are the roses. And of course, the crystal and the china and the sterling silver. In typical grandma style, she invites the children to help her blow out the candles. some of the beautiful roses that Ruth cared for so well.